Welcome friends to Living Large on Little. I'm Beth Stevenson and I'm here with my son Daniel, Dr. Daniel Stevenson. He's a clinical psychologist. He's going to answer some questions about sleep because I have been having quite a bit of trouble sleeping well and so he's going to help me solve those problems. So um, first of all, Daniel, explain insomnia to me. <laughs> So insomnia is a very common uh, complaint that we have in the world of psychology. Uh, it goes along with a lot of different disorders. A lot of times when people have depression or anxiety, they also experience insomnia. Uh, what would be called primary insomnia is insomnia or problem sleeping that isn't related to depression or anxiety. Uh, and that's a very, very common complaint. Uh, so insomnia is problems initiating or maintaining sleep that causes problems for you during the daytime, okay? So for example, uh, if you lay in bed at night and it takes you more than about 30 minutes to fall asleep, that might be considered insomnia if the next day you wake up feeling really, really tired. If you wake up frequently in the night and you have a difficult time falling back asleep and then the next day you're very tired, feeling sluggish, having a hard time concentrating, that would be considered insomnia. Or sometimes people wake up much earlier than they are expecting to wake up uh, before they set their alarm. Say they set their alarm for six o'clock in the morning and they wake up at four o'clock in the morning or five o'clock in the morning and they can't fall back asleep. And then the next day again, they're groggy, sluggish, tired, that would be considered insomnia. So basically it's difficulty maintaining or initiating sleep and then it causes uh, problems for you during the daytime. So if I feel, if I have all of those problems, and I do occasionally, you know, it seems like it'll go for a stretch where I'll have that problem for a week at a time or maybe even a little bit longer. Sure. Um, but I don't, I usually have a hard time getting up and I feel tired at first, but then once I'm up, I feel pretty good and, and it's, you know, not, yeah. not a problem for the rest of the day. Is that insomnia or do I just not need as much sleep? Um, I think that insomnia would, so that would be maybe an acute episode of insomnia where it lasts for a day or two or maybe a week. Maybe you have something going on big that is stressing you out. Um, chronic insomnia is where you would start to run into problems. Insomnia where you have difficulty sleeping three, four, or five times, five nights a week and that for a stretch, a long period for uh, weeks or months even where it's causing some significant impairment. Uh, for you during the day. That would be more considered insomnia. Oh, okay. I wanted to talk a little bit about some of the reasons that people uh, develop insomnia. Um, so generally in the field we talk about three different types of factors with insomnia. There's predisposing factors, precipitating factors, and perpetuating factors. Okay. So as the, as the term might imply, predisposing factors are anything that would uh, kind of traits that you have that might make it more likely that you would develop insomnia in some point. For example, some people might be described as worriers. Someone who is a worrier is predisposed to have insomnia. Or someone who uh, tends to ruminate a, a little bit more would be predisposed to having insomnia. Okay. Mm -hmm. I can do that sometimes, you know. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, some environmental factors that might be considered predisposing factors would be having a partner, a bed partner, your spouse, uh, that has a different sleep schedule than you. For example, maybe they uh, stay up, like to stay up late reading or watching television and you like to go to bed a little bit earlier. That's also a predisposing factor that might increase your uh, likelihood of having insomnia. Or some people just have a weak sleep generating system in lack of technical terms. Uh, your body can generate certain amount of sleep and some people's body generates more sleep than others. So for uh, instance, on average, people, uh, their body should develop or should uh, be able to have seven to nine hours of sleep a night, uh, but there's variation within that. So maybe you, your body just doesn't generate as much sleep as, as someone else and that would be a predisposing factor. Is that like my brain just doesn't produce melatonin as much as... I mean, is that, is that it a hormonal part of, thing or a... That, yeah, that might be part of it. Um, yeah, that might be part of it. Um, but there's a, there's a, the sleep system is kind of complicated. There's a lot of stuff that goes into it. That would kind of, it's kind of beyond the scope of this video. Uh, but yeah, that might be part of it. Okay. Um, the next one is precipitating factors. So if someone has these predisposing factors. Maybe they tend to be a worrier or maybe they have a different schedule from their bed partner. 
Then there's precipitating factors. Um, so maybe something big is happening. Maybe you're really stressed about your kids, or maybe you go through menopause, or maybe you have a big job interview coming up or a big presentation at work going on uh, that's coming up that's caught, it's kind of an acute short-term thing that is causing you to uh, stay up even uh, later or have a harder time falling asleep. Maybe you're a college student and you're slammed with homework, right? Those are precipitating factors. Now, usually what people do is when they're experiencing precipitating factors, the big interviews coming up or they're really worried about their kids, they tend to get less sleep and then they do certain things that to compensate for the lack of sleep that they're getting. For instance, they're up late worrying about their kids or they're worrying about that test or about their uh, job performance. And so they don't get a lot of sleep. So in the morning time, their alarm goes off at six o'clock in the morning and they stay in bed till 6.30 or till seven o'clock or eight o'clock, right? Or maybe they take an afternoon nap. They get home from work and they go down on the couch and they take an hour long nap. Um, sometimes what people do, a lot of times what people do, they increase the amount of time that they're in bed. They're trying to get more sleep. So maybe they got five hours of sleep. So they increase the amount of time they go to bed. Maybe they go to bed early, right? Or maybe they wake up late. Basically, they're increasing the time that they're in bed. Um, and that's good, or it's not good. Yeah, you know, it's not good, and we'll and we'll we'll talk about that here in a minute. Your body can only produce so much sleep, like we talked about before. Usually, most people's bodies produce between seven and nine hours of sleep, and so uh, when you then spend a lot more time in bed, it decreases your body's sleep drive. So, for example, when you wake up in the morning your body's sleep drive steadily begins to increase. The longer you're awake, the stronger of a need that your body has to sleep. And when you take a nap, it drains that your body's sleep drive. And so a lot of people, they, they try and compensate for not getting a lot of sleep by going to bed early, mm -hmm. things like that, and it, it uh, reduces their body's sleep drive. So a major component of treatment or how to help insomnia, how to reduce insomnia is by uh, taking care of that mismatch between how long you're in bed and how long you're actually sleeping. So for example, if on average you are in bed for nine hours a night because you're trying to compensate for a lack of sleep, mm -hmm. but you're only sleeping for five hours, there's a big mismatch there. And what happens is your brain, for, which normally has an association uh, from being in bed with being in bed and being asleep, then start, loses that association. Your brain no longer has an association of being in bed and being asleep. And so uh, when you lay down at, in bed at night, your brain, your brain doesn't think, oh, it's time to sleep and it doesn't shut your brain down and shut your body down for sleep. It thinks, oh, it's time to worry or oh, it's time to uh, stew about my boss or about work, things like that. Yeah. So that's exactly what I experience. I lie down and my mind kicks in and I start ruminating, you know, yep. or just, I just have things on my mind and it's not really even thinking. It's just kind of racing thoughts. Racing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. That's very, very common. Yeah. So the way to, the way to, the way to handle that is, um, don't spend too much time in bed. And that sounds really simplistic and, uh, but really it comes down to that. If you're generating, if your body is generating five hours of sleep a night, don't spend eight hours in bed, right? So first, what you might want to do is you set a, a set wake time every day, and you get up at the same time every single day. So for instance, if you know that uh, you know you got you need to be at work by 7:30, or you need to get about your business by eight o'clock, then you might say, okay, I'm going to wake up at six o'clock every day, and try not to sleep in on the weekends either. Maybe 15 minutes, 30 minutes, a little bit on the weekends is okay but you want to try hard not to sleep in and try and make up for sleep on the way, on the weekends. Okay, that ruins everything you, you that ruins your sleep during the week. Um, so set a, a set wake time, six o'clock in the morning or whatever works best for you. Okay. And then you want to push your bedtime back to kind of match how much sleep you're getting. So if you're getting six hours okay. of sleep at night and you want to wake up at six o'clock in the morning, then you're not even going to try and go to bed until right around midnight, 1130 or midnight. Okay? okay. And what is going to happen is your sleep is going to condense. You're not going to wake up as much in the night. You're going to have an easier time falling asleep. You're not going to wake up early. Okay. And then as you, as your sleep gets more condensed, then you can back up what time you go to bed. Right. So a little bit earlier and just do it in small increments. So maybe 
if you if you're going to bed at midnight maybe you bump it back to 11:45 for a week and then 11:30 for a week so you're kind of stretching out how long you're in bed very slowly okay but you don't want to stretch it out too much so if you're if you're waking up at six o'clock every day uh, eventually you might get to the point where you're going to bed at 10:30 at night okay and you're gonna get seven and a half good hours of sleep straight like that okay. <laughs> So that would be called uh, sleep restriction. You're basically restricting how much time you're in bed and then slowly expanding it uh, so that you get a, a more sound sleep. The other part of treatment that would be uh, important is called stimulus control. We kind of talked a little bit about how a lot of times people when they're, they have insomnia, they do all sorts of different things in bed. What are some things you do when you're not sleeping in bed? Well, um, mostly I'm just worrying, but Sometimes I will read or mm -hmm. um, lately I get up and go read. Mm -hmm. Good. So. Yeah. Um, so reading, worrying, watching TV, those are all things that are really common. You really want your brain to, have a, to associate your room, your bedroom, and your bed with sleeping. Okay? And all those little activities that you do in your room or in your mm -hmm. bed throughout the day or at nighttime that are not sleeping, make it hard for your brain to to associate bed and, with sleep okay so uh, what we would call stimulus control means you stop doing those other things in your bedroom don't read in your bedroom right go read on the couch in the living room don't uh, don't lay in bed awake at night if you're in bed for more than 15 minutes or so and awake get up and go do something else in a different room right and then when you feel tired again, go back to bed. And what you might notice is the first few times you do that, you go back to bed and all of a sudden you feel awake again. Well, that's fine. That's because your brain doesn't have a really strong association with bed and being asleep. So you get back out of bed and you go do something else. You can do chores, you clean your house, you can read a book, you can do whatever you want, it doesn't matter. But just make sure that you don't fall asleep anywhere else but your bed. You want your brain to associate your bed with sleep. Okay. Now, that means that you might have to not watch TV in your bedroom. That's, uh, that's a big one that a lot of people like to do. Uh, no reading in bed, right? And you might say that, well, I used to do those things and I never had insomnia, so that can't be it. But the issue is, kind of like we talked about before, those are things that maintain the insomnia. They, they might not have been an issue before, but now that you do have insomnia, they maintain it and they, make it, okay. they keep it going. Got it. So those are a few things you can do. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit about just some general basic sleep hygiene tips. Uh, most people have heard of some of these. Um, shower before you go to bed? Yeah, Got it. shower before you go to bed, that's right. <laughs> but actually, there, what, that you joke about it, but actually um, there's something to that where your body falls asleep more easily as its temperature gradually drops. And so uh, if you do shower you know, 30 or 40 minutes before bed, your body temperature will kind of slowly drop after you take that shower. Uh, and then that will actually help you fall asleep. So uh, don't bundle up and get all cozy and warm right before you go to bed. Right. You wanna you wanna have you wanna sleep in a dark, cool place, not freezing cold. But you want it to be cool. Uh, it's really hard to sleep when you're too hot. I think most people would yeah. agree with that. Yeah. Right. So you wanna sleep in a dark, cool place. If you have a lot of light, natural light coming into your room, uh, try and get some dark curtains or something to block some of that light out. Another thing that's important is no caffeine uh, within four or five hours of when you want to go to sleep. All right? So uh, caffeine has a half-life of about six hours, so you want to make sure that the caffeine is out of your system uh, before bed. So if you're planning on going to bed at 10 o'clock, I wouldn't drink any caffeine after five, four or five o'clock in the afternoon. Um, and also no nicotine within about two hours before bed, because that can also uh, act as a stimulant and, and wake you up and, and cause you to be physically aroused. So is there enough caffeine in like a cup of hot chocolate or something to cause problems for an insomniac? I, I doubt it. Um, I don't think that a cup of hot cocoa would, would have enough caffeine in it to, to cause serious issues. But again, if you're having issues, um, it makes sense to try and cut that out and see if it helps. Okay. All right. Well, I'll try it all. Thanks very much for doing this yeah, with me. Good luck. And thank you for watching. I hope you'll subscribe and like us. <laughs>